you know, there is uh, two things that I love and it's very inspiration. One um, um, I've, I've read by uh, Picasso and he said that everything you can imagine is real. Everything, any ideas, any idea you have in your head is actually real if you really work hard to make it real. And you will always gonna find people around you who maybe doubt you. There is people around you who will bring you down. There is people around you maybe jealous, but it might be one single person who will lift you up and help you. And that's you when you believe in that idea. And I love this quote. And I actually love, um, I've been told um, also something really amazing. Uh, it says in Arabic, it says, Mawlid al Abqariya hiya tilka al lahba alati yaktashif al insan hu fiha makam in mawhibatihi mahma kana umro. It means that the, the birth of brilliance and genius is the moment that you discover your passion in life. Then you will be able to do the impossible. Um, hello everyone, I'm Amalia and I am so so happy to welcome you all to our second Munsha Pirates talk. For everyone new here, uh, Munsha Pirates is a community that aims to give young people the encouragement and initial knowledge they need to pursue their dreams in this ever-changing society. The Pirates talks give us all op the opportunity to ask big people from all around the world, not the uh, only the typical uh, interview style questions, but questions we are really interested to know about. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Yasmin and today we are here with Mustafa Salame. He was the 16th person in history and the only Jordanian to complete the Explorers Grand Slam, which consists of reaching both the North and the South Pole and also climbing the highest mountain in each continent. He's also the author of the wonderful novel dreams of a refugee, and now he wants to do the 777 challenge, run seven marathons on seven continents in just seven days. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Mastava. Thank you very much for having me, and um, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to get your question and answer it and have a great one hour with you all. Thank you. Uh, just a few technicalities before starting with the interview. I will be the one uh, making sure your questions are answered today. We would also like to ask a few courageous pirates, yes, I'm talking to you, uh, to come and ask your questions yourself, yourselves if you wish. Yeah, thanks, Amalia. Um, Mustafa, I think it would be great if you could start by introducing yourself. And since you love challenges, I want to challenge you to describe yourself in just five words. And I will be counting. Five words, okay. Yeah. Um, I would say um, discipline. Um, uh, I would say um, uh, making things happen and um, uh, adventurer, um, helping communities and um, a writer and readers. Thank you. <laughs> You said adventure and looking at your journey, you're obviously a very adventurous person. I mean, climbing mountains, even though you don't know anything about mountaineering, right? That's a crazy dream. So I want to ask you, how did you overcome doubt and discouragement? Because I'm pretty sure that most of your friends and family members weren't really down with that idea at first. I would say because um, when I had that dream about the mountain, I think I believed in it uh, so much. I believed in it 100%. And I always believed in when you want something, the whole universe will come together. They will conspire to help you to achieve it. But it had to start from you. So you have to uh, believe in that dream and not have one single doubt because if you believe in it 100%, and what's important when you believe in a dream that you have the knowledge to try to tell people about it. And when you do that, then you will be able to uh, make other people believe in you. 
and that's what happened with me. Uh, as you said, I've never climbed a mountain in my life. I, I, I actually thought Everest was in America. So I, I didn't know. I had absolutely no knowledge, no knowledge whatsoever. But I gained the knowledge while uh, trying to achieve my dream. And I have an, a great, amazing support uh, started from the King of Jordan to all companies who uh, sponsor me throughout the year. Uh, not just to climb Everest, then to do the Seven Summit and go on to do the Grand Slam and ski the South Pole, North Pole and Greenland. So you mentioned that knowledge is a very important part of this. Um, most of us have a bit of trouble right now to learn because we're on our own, right? We can just go to school and ask our teachers. But you know that feeling, right? You came to the UK without knowing any English but you still learned English and um, you had a very successful career. Then you wanted to climb the Mount Everest without knowing mountaineering and you learned everything by yourself and you're not a runner, but still you want to run marathons, right? How do you do it? I mean, you know, because I really want to do it because it, it, it's me that want to do it. I don't need to, uh, uh, you know, at the moment, I mean, if you look uh, in, in this time of age, I mean, you have, everything you can do online you don't, you don't have to go anywhere yes the school is important to go to but you can gain knowledge you can gain information by being online as well so when i moved to uh, um, when i was in the uk i didn't speak a single word of english i i taught myself english because i couldn't afford to go to an english school to learn english so what i used to do is write 10 words every single day and five sentences and put it in front of me while I'm uh, um, washing dishes for five years in the kitchen. And that's how I learned English. And that's how I went to university. And I, were, I, I wrote my first essay uh, uh, um, and then many of them. Um, and if you look seven years before I went to university, I did not speak a single word of English. It's just, hello, hello, how are you? Whatever it is, like, you know, normal stuff. So, so I guess, uh, you know, I guess knowledge, uh, uh, if you thrive the knowledge, if you want it, you, you'll find it absolutely everywhere. I didn't know anything about mountaineering, but I went online, I ordered some books and I start reading. So, and, and you can... And you can get, because I always think knowledge make you uh, somebody, it's not about education. It's about turning everything negative around you to positive. That's what, uh, uh, for me, that's what somebody uh, who gain knowledge and become uh, um, educated is somebody who can turn anything from negative to positive. Yeah, I guess we can really exploit the pandemic too. Um, but I think that learning a language is a bit easier than learning something like how to run a marathon. How are you preparing right now? Well, I got up every single morning. I'll go and do my 10K. I come back. I do my push-up. I do my setup. In the afternoon, I do another training. So um, it's not, in the past two years, I've been, I've been doing that. So every opportunity that I have, I will go. Yes, pandemic now, it's it's a big thing, but I still be able to go out and do the run. Even I don't need to go to the gym. I can just go out, do a run. I can be home doing a setup. I can do push-up. I can do any exercise at home and just buy something online, uh, a little weight, and I can do that. So it's not you know, I, I was in Africa, I did lots, we, we climbed the mountain, I thought, you know what, why not stay another 10 days and I can do high altitude running. And this is what I did. In three weeks time, I'm going to go to Everest to guide the first Emirati woman and Palestinian and I have an Italian guy and an Iraqi guy to climb Everest. And I'm going to be in base camp leading the expedition. So I'm going to take the opportunity every two days. I'm going to go for a run at 5,000 meter and do that. So I'm practicing everything I can. I'm reading everything about marathon. I talk to people who I know who did marathon in their life. And I think from my experience, you know, uh, I need to be prepared uh, physically. But 70% of everything we do in adventure, it's in your head. It's mentally. As long as you're strong mentally and you can push yourself, you can do it. Now, 
for some people, I think seven marathon in seven days is in seven uh, 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 continent. It's mental. It's something that's maybe impossible. But yeah. when you prepare for it and you plan it properly, 100%, and you prepare yourself and your body, um, you can definitely uh, achieve it. So how do you prepare the mental part? I, I think mental part is, it's a big part, but I think the 30, so if I say climbing a mountain or doing the 777, 70% is mentally. So we have 30% left. What are these 30%? 10% are uh, uh, getting fit and prepare. So I have to have the fitness side. 10% is finding the time and the money to support this big expedition. And the last 10% is the, techni the technicality, uh, the technical side of what I'm doing. So the technical side, I, I uh, ask an expert who's a marathon runner, and now he become a personal trainer, and he give me all the stuff I need to do. How many times I run, how do I run, uh, what do I need to do, what weight I need to use, that's done, technical. And then the sponsorship and the time I found and I found the sponsorship and I was lucky to have the time and a sponsorship. Now, the last thing is the fitness. That's what I'm doing. I'm very, very disciplined that I need to get up every single day to do that training because I know that's what's going to happen. Now, when I'm doing the marathon, if I am in the mountain and I am giving up, my brain will tell me, why are you giving up? You absolutely did everything that needs to be done. You know everything about the technicality. Therefore, you've done all the training, so you are very fit. So you shouldn't be given up. Now, if you're not prepared properly, if you're not fit enough, and you didn't train enough, and you went there, here is going to play with your head. You're going to say, you know what? Oh, God, I didn't, I didn't train properly. Oh, I didn't do enough. And then my brain will say, yes, you did not do enough, then giving up, it's going to be easier. So that's what's important, that you prepare for everything so you can give strength to your head and your brain to keep going. Okay, thank you. Um, you also mentioned that you help other people climb mountains, right? Yeah. Um, you, I think you also help people who are blind or have other special needs, right? Or, um, yes. for example, I think you also raise money for charities by Absolutely. climbing mountains. And that's yeah. something that I would have never thought of. I never thought that mountaineering can help other people. Um, how do you do that? And how can I use my own skills and interests to make the world a better place? You see, uh, um, when I... It, it start climbing the mountain it was about all uh, to, to take the Jordanian flag be the first the first the first doing whatever I did and everything changed really because somebody opened my eye an 11 years old girl I visited a, a, a cancer hospital to do a talk for uh, these kids and the nurse came to me and said one of the girls cannot come out of her room because her immune system is very low would you be able to go and do a talk for her so I went into her room I took my laptop I entered the room and you have all these like tubes in her nose and the mouth and you know uh, uh, um, went in and I, I put the, the laptop I showed her Everest I showed how he climbed I explained to her and she asked me three questions that changed my life she said to me, how, uh, uh, how many days did you take to climb Everest? I said, it took us about 70 days. And she said, how, many, uh, how long did you stay in the summit? I said, 45 minutes. And she said, what did you use to climb the mountain to keep you safe? And I said, you know, I had the Sherpa, I had the ropes, uh, carabiners, I have my harness. And then she said to me, she said, you know, that I've been climbing my own Everest in the past two years. And every single day, I don't stay in a summit of happiness. I stay in a summit of my pain because I'm taking all these chemo uh, chemotherapy and uh, more than 45 minutes every day. And she said, the only things that keep me going is hope. <clears throat> and I don't see, she said to me that, I don't see that you're doing, some, you're doing it for yourself. I said, 
you know, so she wake me up completely. And from that day, that was 2012, just four years after I climbed Everest. And I decided if I'm going to do any climb or I'm going to do absolutely anything, it had to be for a great cause. And from 2012 to 2020, the initiatives that I was involved with have fundraised $5 million, more than $5 million. And I decided I want to help anybody who want to achieve a dream that thinks it's impossible. So a blind uh, a guy came to me and he said he want to climb to Kilimanjaro. I, I founded uh, the sponsorship for him. I took him and he stood in the top of Africa. And then uh, another guy who was in a wheelchair who lost his uh, uh, um, legs uh, when he was young, and I took him to the top of Africa, and he was in a wheelchair, and he stood in the top of Africa in his leg. And that really, if you bought the Grand Slam and becoming one of 13 or 16 people in the world doing what I did, it's absolutely nothing compared to what I actually uh, were able to do for uh, people and community. And I think anybody can use their job. Anybody can use any resources to do something good. Uh, in your own area, um, uh, people that you know, maybe friends that need help. There is always people around you that somebody there need help. Maybe it's not just physically, mentally, not just financially. So we can all do the little things that we do. And you know what? This is what keeps me going. And, and 777, it will be also for a cause. And uh, I, I always take people to climb mountain for the first time. I prepare them mentally and physically. And I always tell them, listen, why not find uh, uh, an organization and let's fundraise? If you cannot fundraise the money, let's, have, uh, let's talk about this organization. Because, you know, there is people might not know about this. And... Uh, uh, and you can make uh, uh, different. We all can make different if we really want to do it. Yeah. So we just take our interest or skill and then combine it with a cause. Hundred percent. Any interest okay. you, you see, any job you would do, in anything you can easy be able to use what you know and your knowledge to help other people. Okay. And um, the girl said that she was climbing her own Everest the whole time. And you also often say that everyone has their own Everest. What do you mean by that? What I mean is uh, everyone have their own Everest because Everest for me, it was a mountain. I, I was able to go on the top. I did not conquer it. I conquered myself when I came back. And um, for everyone have an Everest in their life because it could be education, it could be your work, it could be your family, it could be your friend, it could be something, uh, maybe you have some sort of sickness and you're trying to uh, uh, get um, uh, over it. So uh, we can bring the mountain when we have some, when I have uh, a climb and I'm going to go and climb the mountain, I do everything I can to prepare uh, to have every single things that will, will make me succeed. And then maybe there is sometimes something like 2005, I was really prepared and I had a problem in my ulcer. I had a bleeding ulcer at 23,000 feet. So I have to come down. In 2007, uh, the same thing. Uh, I have a chest infection, so I come down. 2008, I was prepared the same, maybe less than 2005 and seven, but I made it because uh, uh, I, I was in second anyway. So if I want to uh, finish my high school and I want to get A-levels because I wanted to become a pilot, a um, um, uh, doctor, uh, art, whatever you want to be, you need to work really hard to be able to achieve it. Very hard. If you are working in a company and you want to become a manager or the CEO, you need to work super hard. So when you know what's your own Everest and your own Everest is your dream, is your goal, then you have this in front of your eyes and you remind yourself every single day when you look at the mirror that that's what I want to do. Uh, sometimes you might not 
uh, uh, do it in the first time, you need to try the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, until you do it. Sometimes the roads to it, a little bit difficult, that's okay. You can change the road a little bit, but never change your dream. We can look at the moment and what's happening in pandemic and what's happening in everything uh, around us. And we have to take, uh, um, of course, we have to be aware of what happened around us, but in the same time, we should not forget about that goal and dream in front of us. Uh, I had, uh, um, 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 I was um, um, uh, COVID-19 positive. I had to stay for 10 days. It was very hard. I have high temperature. I wasn't feeling very well, but I know that I have to go through this to uh, and become better. And luckily, because I was fit, I eat healthy, I was able to come out with it with no damage. And I gave myself exactly a month before I start going running again. So I have to be, I have to play it really right and uh, not to hurt myself and also to make sure that um, I'm, I'm being safe for myself and the people around me. Okay. Um, but what if I don't know? what my Everest is. Because like, I, I just graduated from high school and a lot of my friends, they don't know what to do with their lives, you know? Like, we don't know which ideas are good or bad or, you know, we don't have any ideas at all. Do you have any advice for us? I would say we all have passion. Yeah, everyone knows deep inside what their passion is. And sometimes, they will not know it very early in time. I was 34 when I had that dream. I was 38 when I climbed Everest. I was 41 when I knew exactly what is it I wanna do uh, when I start fundraising money for charity. But if I go back when I was a little boy coming out from school and going to sell uh, a sweet uh, uh, around the refugee camp where I used to stay, I did it because I want to help my family. When I finished school, high school, I start working uh, uh, straight away as a waiter in different restaurant in, in Jordan. I wanted to help my dad and keep my sister and brother at school because my dad didn't have the money. So, and I couldn't go to university. Uh, but I made, an, uh, um, when I moved to England, my main things was to go to university. And I found my passion. It was cooking and hospitality. So I went and studied hospitality for four years. And I became a food and beverage manager for a five-star hotel. And then my dream was to become a general manager for a five-star hotel, but everything changed when I wake up from that dream and I climbed mountain. Is mountain my passion? Well, I would say my passion is to help other people and to try to fundraise money for other charity using uh, a climbing. So I know what's my passion now. So, I mean, you know, we all have uh, 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 these uh, um, you know, if you're passionate about something and we really like it, uh, you want to follow that. So I always say, follow your heart and let your mind do uh, the work. That's how I do it. This is what I've been doing all the time. So you need to see what you like now, what's really move you, what's excite you so much. And then you want to go after it and you want to do it. Uh, if you want to study something, you really want to make sure that's the things that you're passionate about. Because in the future, you will definitely find out what you study is going to actually help you uh, in your life. Hospitality and tourism definitely helped me in my life, definitely helped me doing what I'm doing. When I'm uh, um, organizing and guiding and leading trips, uh, I know how to lead it, what food, how, what is the service, because I had that massive experience uh, in hospitality. Sounds like we cannot make a wrong choice because it's it's going to work out anyway. And that's really relieving to hear. Um, you said so many inspirational things and it's only been 26 minutes. Um, <laughs> now I want to ask you, have you ever been told something very inspirational, something that just stuck with you? You know, there is uh, two things that I love and it's very inspirational. One, um, um, 
I've, I've read by uh, Picasso and he said that everything you can imagine is real. Everything, any ideas, any idea you have in your head is actually real if you really work hard to make it real. And you will always gonna find people around you who maybe doubt you. There is people around you who will bring you down. There is people around you maybe jealous, but it might be one single person who will lift you up and help you. And that's you when you believe in that idea. And I love this quote. And I actually love, um, I've been told um, also something really amazing. Uh, it says in Arabic, it says, Mawlid al Abqariya hiya tilka al lahba alati yaktashif al insanu fiha makam in mawhibatihi mahma kana umro. It means that the, the birth of brilliance and genius is the moment that you discover your passion in life. Then you will be able to do the impossible. And something my dad always told me that there is two kinds of people, people who follow life and they take everything, they take this and this and this and, and they become heavy moving and uh, they're not concentrating on one thing and they end up uh, not doing uh, what they were supposed to do. And there is other people who life follow them. So you take one single thing and you take it with you, you concentrate, on it and you know exactly where you're going and they are the people who always achieve uh, um, uh, their goal so you have to concentrate in one single thing on the time finish it and move on because every time you open a door there is another door to be open and another door another door as long as the first door is closed you will never be able to go anywhere Wow, oh, your father is very poetic. No surprise <laughs> that you're so inspirational. Um, I see that there are a lot of questions in the chat box. Maybe we should move on with the Q&A. Sure. Uh, we first have uh, Navina, who has agreed to come up and ask uh, her brilliant question herself. So uh, we're going to bring Navina up. Uh, my question is, what was your turning point in your life? My turning point, I mean, there is more than one turning point, definitely. But I think uh, maybe the, the biggest turning point in my life when I was working as a waiter in Jordan. And always I wanted to come out and, and go uh, somewhere bigger, and especially the UK. And I think I have brought all this energy on me to achieve it. And while I was serving a table uh, in a restaurant in Jordan, a man, uh, there were this uh, about 10 people in the, in the table. And, and the man who invited them asked me to come in. And he said, uh, do you wanna go to London? I said, I would love to go to London. And he said, my uh, brother is the Jordanian ambassador in London and he's looking for somebody to work in his house and make coffee and clean. And I said, yes, I would definitely go. And I think that was the biggest turning point because I don't know what will happen if I stayed in Jordan. And the other biggest turning point, definitely, when I uh, woke up at, in 2004 in January and I saw myself in the top of the world praying for peace. And that was maybe the second biggest turning point in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, someone asked, uh, when climbing mountains, what is the worst thing that could happen based on your experience? When you climb mountain, what's the worst things could happen? I think, you know, I mean, there is so many things could happen in the mountain. Uh, in the mountain itself, maybe an avalanche could happen, like it happened in 2015. And, you know, the whole mountain had to close and, you know, people died. Uh, when you are so prepared and you pay a big amount of money, like sixty, seventy thousand dollars to climb the mountain, and you have something super small, uh, like I had, which is um, uh, an ulcer, and I have to come down after uh, I had just I climbed uh, until about twenty-four thousand feet, so I have another 
uh, uh, less than 5,000 feet and I have to tame back. That's the difficult bit. Uh, I think it's, it's um, sometimes I wouldn't call it failed uh, when you go to the mountain. I always say, you know, you, you try to do something and I have not failed, but, you know, I think I will always say that I've learned so I can come back and, and do it again and again. I think this is will be the most um, difficult really part or, you know, seeing one, uh, uh, seeing people who, you know, die in the mountain like two years ago when I was in Everest and I know this guy and he actually, he actually uh, borrowed my uh, gloves and my uh, mittens and he went up, he never came down. And when we went up in the same way, I can see my mittens in his hand. I mean, that is difficult. So you, uh, in 2008, when I climbed uh, Everest and uh, above the seven, uh, the, the above 28,000 feet, you can see these dead bodies everywhere. And you'll always look uh, at them and, and see, okay, they, they did um, um, what, they love to do and, and, and they die for it. But, you know, there is always that a bit of sadness and difficult to see these people because you always remember uh, maybe it can be you. So, uh, so that always put me, especially when I'm leading or I'm, I'm climbing, that safety for me is the most important things. I have did about 60 expedition and went to the South Pole uh, uh, and, and North Pole and Greenland, and I still have my 10 finger and nine and a half toes, which is very important. Uh, and I can come back and, and tell my story. You know, hearing about the dead bodies, I'm wondering, don't you ever get scared about climbing mountains? You know, I, I always believe, you know, there is, uh, we all gonna die and it's one day is gonna come, we're gonna die. Nobody can delay that day. So that's a very strong belief uh, that I have always in my life. And I cannot hide uh, somewhere um, thinking I'm gonna be worried. Maybe I can be in a taxi uh, uh, um, and, and have an accident uh, and die more, 100 times more than in the mountain. Um, you know, you can be in your bed and you never wake up. So um, there is no, I don't have the fear of death, definitely. Uh, I'm always uh, try to make the best if I can to be safe, 100% uh, safe. I look at the weather, like for example, in, in October and January, I was uh, taking a team to a, a mountain called Hemlong. It's about 7,200 meters. And um, we went up, we were there for a long time. The weather was really bad and I have to wait at base camp for 10 days. We went up again and we were just 800 meters from the summit. So we can, we can go up, but the weather picked up and it was really bad. So I have to turn them back again and we wait a little bit. I looked at the weather, the weather is not gonna get better. So we left. We can easily just go there and, and put everyone's life in danger. Uh, and do it because I always believe the mountain is gonna always be there. A mountain is always, it's you that you have to be there to climb it. Uh, we also have another great question from uh, uh, Shilan. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, we're bringing you up to ask your question. Um, hello. Um... <laughs> I'm nervous, sorry. Um, I ask you, which feelings do you get when you reach the top of the mountain? Which what? Which film? Wh which feelings do you get? Ah, which feeling? Well, I mean, when you get in the top of the mountain, the only feeling you have is like, oh my God, how I'm going to go down. <laughs> That's the first thing you see. see. Uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, I would never be able to describe it. You have to... Uh, you really have to experience it to be able to feel it. Now, I think it's not just being in the top of the mountain. I think the journey that you took to take you all the way to the top of the mountain, that is uh, the feeling that you're gonna have. Really? Is the preparation, <laughs> is the training that you did, is the time that you took, the sacrifice, everything that you have done to get you to where you are in the top of the mountain. I remember 10 meter, when I saw the summit of Everest, just 10 meter from the summit, I, 
broke down and I was crying uh, like a baby. I was really, really crying. And uh, because I saw that dream of mine four years ago, and I saw going, doing all this training, work and asking people for sponsorship, trying in 2005, in 2007. So when I went up, I just sat down in the summit, me and the Sherpa, and you don't really see anything because you just see a blue sky because uh, uh, it's uh, the cloud is 3000 feet under your feet. So you don't see anything. And I remember the first things I want to do is to talk to my mom and dad. And I talked to his majesty, the king, but it was like 10 to four in the morning. It was very, very early, but I was told I have to speak to the king. And I was lucky to be in the top of the mountain in the 25th of May, 2008, which is, uh, was the Jordan independence day. But when I called my dad, my dad was so excited, staying up all night, you know, he was worried about me and he was so excited. And, and I said, you know, can I speak to my mom? And then when I um, spoke to my mom, I said, mom, I'm in the top of Everest, I made it. And my mom straight away told me, uh, did you have a breakfast yet or not? And I said, mom, I'm in the top of the mountain. And she said, are you cold? And I said, okay, mom, <laughs> just give me my dad. Uh, so uh, the only things what mom was concerned about is my well-being, and it was so sweet. And um, when I spoke to his majesty, it was too early in the morning uh, in, in Jordan. It was like the, uh, four o'clock in the morning because it was about seven o'clock when I reached. And, and the first things his majesty said, I hope you're in the top of the mountain call me in this hour. And I said, of course I am. I would never call you in this hour if I was in top of it. So, uh, yeah, so there is all these feelings that you have. And you know what? You can climb Everest or climb Kilimanjaro or you go and climb a, a, a 2000 meter mountain here in Dublin. And it's exactly the same things, that beautiful feeling that you have that you are in the top of the mountain. It doesn't matter if you're on the top of the world or top of Africa, it's exactly the same. And I can see that now when I take people, I've been, uh, I've done, I did about 33 expedition in Kilimanjaro and every single time I see people how get excited and crying. And I always remember the first time I've, I've reached the summit in Everest. That's so beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we also have another question about what is your motivation for life and how do you motivate yourself? Because certainly you've done a lot. <laughs> uh -huh. I, guess, I guess my motivation of life is making a change, is making change in people's lives. That's, that's my biggest motivation. Um, what wake me up early in the morning and, and to go for a run and do my training because I know in January 2022 I'm doing a big expedition uh, run 777 because that's going to highlight a massive issue that is dear to my heart so uh, uh, that pushed me to do it that's my motivation uh, my motivation now I'm, I'm you know I wake up and I'm, I'm published the first children book called Everest Dare to Dream uh, after um, in Jordan, they teach my story in, in the fourth grade and eighth grade and high school, which is which is I'm very very proud of, and that gave me more motivation to uh, try to bring this beautiful sport outdoor and concentrate in outdoor education to bring it into schools in Jordan and the Arab world and let people. Uh, uh, be interested more in, in adventure because that was in our culture. It's not like Europe and America and stuff, but now it's becoming a culture, which is amazing. So there is lots, my kids is my motivation, you know, my little now, you know, my, my kids, um, I'm in quarantine here. I have to do one week quarantine and I have a veranda and my kids came uh, outside the veranda here to say hello and, and Ayman, uh, the older one, was doing, uh, I said, you know, I'm prepared now, so I'm doing 70 push up for you, daddy. So he was like doing 70 push up. He's about 11 years old. And he said, I've been working really, you know, getting fit and stuff. And that just like, that will give me the best, uh, the best motivation. So, you know, my mom, my dad, my friend, everyone around me uh, uh, give me that motivation to be able to make the change that the small, 
a, a boy and a girl in a refugee camp that I visit. And I, I try to tell them uh, to, uh, that, you know, th there is a light in the end of the tunnel. You can do absolutely anything you can because here is me, a refugee kids who now did what I did. So all this, everything around me always give me a motivation. Uh, there's also a question about how do you keep yourself and your body healthy besides working out? Well, I mean, you know, to, I sleep early. Uh, 9.30 in the evening, I'm in bed. Five o'clock, I wake up. So I sleep through all night, which is amazing. And I'm very lucky to be able to do that. I drink lots and lots of water. That's, 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 really a biggest important things. I try not to eat sugar or salt. I try to have a good breakfast, lunch and dinner. So I, I you know, away from um, anything that is like have cooked with oil and stuff. You know, I, I try to do my best to do all this stuff. And, and I think everyone can do that. I mean, it's not, it's not impossible. It's not difficult to do it. Uh, I think everyone can do it. And I think it's really important to start from now. If somebody told me when I was young, this is what I need to do maybe, and, and I could listen to them and did it, it would be great. But there is absolutely no, um, you know, I, I smoked two bucks of cigarette in 2004, before 2004. And, you know, I wasn't, I had absolutely no, um, you know, I was eating really like rubbish food every day. And I, uh, I didn't do any form of exercise. So I changed that and, you know, and you give it, you need to have a routine and discipline. If you said, I don't want to have sugar for, uh, that's it. Then you can just, you need to have the routine. So you need to stop for four weeks and be disciplined. And then that's it. You're not going to miss it. Uh, it's like absolutely anything. You can give up anything you want if you have the discipline and the only way to do it is like you have the routine every day for two to four weeks, and then you can uh, give up uh, uh, anything that is not good for you. Uh, we also have another question uh, about uh, and asking if you would ch if you would change something in your life so far because obviously you've done. You've come, you've come such a big way. So, but is there something that you would want to change or you would have liked to go, to go differently maybe? I would not change absolutely nothing in my life. The good things and the bad things, you know, the mistakes or not everything that I did in my life is made me the way I am now. So I will never regret or change anything. Um, I'm living my dream now. Everything that I do is living my dream. And I think when you come to that point, saying that you are living your dream, when somebody asks you, what is your dream? And you can say, I'm living my dream. Then you know that you will come to that a conclusion to have a peace of mind. And when you put your head in a pillow, you can sleep in three seconds. And, um, you know, I don't think about, you know, yesterday, I always think yesterday is history. Tomorrow is mystery, and today is the gift that we're still alive, which is we can do so much now. We can be happy, we can turn things, which is why we call it present. Yeah, gift is present, and we should always appreciate every little thing. When I was in the South Pole for 65 days, sledging behind me 180 kilograms, with the temperature going to minus 30 to minus 50, I was just um, thinking about these little things in life, just to sit in a toilet and close it, to have a nice hot uh, toast with a little butter, to have a proper cup of coffee. So all the simple things in life, to see my kids, to see the smile of people, to see some animals, because I could, the, the, in the South Pole, you see absolutely nothing. So the only things I miss is that little things in life, not the big car, not the big house, not the big restaurant and big meal. No, it's always that little things. And we should really appreciate uh, uh, these little things in life because the most important things is your health and the health of the people that you love around you. And we can see now 
uh, in this pandemic, I mean, you know, I, I took some of social media from my phone because every time you open your phone or Facebook, the only things we see is, you know, somebody's dad, die, granddad, whatever, and it's all related to Corona. And it's really, um, it's really horrible. And, and, and you see how, uh, you know, we, we are lucky to be alive. We are lucky to have uh, the loved one around us alive. And that's what's important in the end of the day. Yeah, I, I think it is really important to uh, kind of appreciate every small moment and every little thing. Uh, there's also another question uh, sure. asking if you have had an idol growing up or as a child. I would guess like my idol was my dad because I saw my dad working so hard. But my biggest idol, my hero is my mom because my mom had 10 children and, you know, we grow, we all grow up to be good people. And I think what my mom did uh, was a great job. My dad was working most of the time. And I always, you know, loved that, that my dad worked so hard to keep us and give us a, 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 a nice little flat uh, um, to, uh, as our house. Uh, but I'll guess my mom is, you know, I mean, yesterday was the International Woman Day. And I always think uh, that, um, you know, everything that happened in my life is, is definitely uh, is accredited to a, a woman, which is my mom. And um, I really a big believer, uh, especially in the Middle East, that, you know, I started to 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 motivate other women to climb mountain. And when now we have lots of other women who climb mountain, because I always think women can do exactly what man can do and more. When a woman can be pregnant for nine months, I don't think a man could be pregnant in one day. So uh, but we, we're not strong enough to, to do it. So um, yeah, I would definitely, my answer will be my mom. Um, that, that, that was just so, so adorable. I just, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, there's another question asking, what did you do before coming to the UK? Uh, before I come to the UK, I was, um, I finished high school and I started working as a waiter. I worked in an Italian restaurant first, and then I worked in a, a, a Swiss restaurant in Jordan. That was my job, uh, uh, nothing, nothing else. And it was all in hospitality. Do you have anything um, kind of, uh, there's people asking like, how long did it take to climb Everest or was it cold on the Everest? Is there something that kind of uh, weird that no one has asked you about or something that, oh, um, that was weird? Um, let's see, I, I think, Maybe the, you know, I think when we are now going to Everest and I think, you know, um, the, the biggest things in Everest is that you're gonna stay in the tents for two months. So you have to be, you know, you have to have all the stuff entertainment to keep you going. So I have some books and then I will download maybe some movies and maybe some stuff like you know i download recently uh, the vikings so uh, and it's about uh, 60 episodes so i'm looking forward to really know more about vikings and i wrote uh, i actually uh, i i got a book about the vikings read it so really you need to make yourself busy on the mountain because you're there for a long time when you arrive the camp you're there for about six hours until you sleep so you really need to do something to make you uh, uh, go and maybe you play card with your uh, uh, friends and stuff but you know on the mountain as well going to the toilet is not as as normal as we do it uh, most of the time especially if you are in the south pole you have to build your uh, toilet you have to get uh, you have to make a wall behind the toilet because if it's windy and you want to go there, you don't want to have a frostbite somewhere that is, uh, you're not going to be able to sit down at all. So uh, the food that you take, uh, you know, all this stuff, I think it's, it's what's make your uh, uh, trip uh, very comfortable. And uh, uh, so on Everest, at least you'll have somebody to cook for you in, uh, in, in base camp. 
there's somebody there, there is a, a, a chef who cook all the food for you. But when you start going up, you, you're gonna start using dehydrated food. But uh, a place like Everest is amazing because you have lots of people. So you can go to other camp and you meet people from, <clears throat> from Italy to Japan, to South Korea, to India, to Iran, to South America. So the whole world in this small space, which is really uh, uh, what I value most when I go there. But if I compare it to the South Pole, you there all the time, you eat in dehydrated food. You might be eat it for 65 days, which is, which is really not very nice. Uh, and um, and uh, the cold constantly, you are cold. Uh, on Everest, maybe, you know, you get cold, uh, maybe when you start going up to the summit and stuff, or maybe you leave early to go to another camp. But I wouldn't say it's as cold as the places when you go to South Pole, North Pole, or Greenland. And I have no idea what the question was. <laughs> um, by the way, I have one more question. Okay. Um, you mentioned a few times that you want to connect 777 to a cause as well. Uh, what cause is it? Well, the cause that I'm doing, it's called 777 for Palestine. So it's going to be for a Palestinian cause and, and to talk about uh, a Palestinian city, to talk about Palestinian food, that hummus is Palestinian, falafel is Palestinian, olive oil is Palestinian. So all this stuff will talk about the uh, Palestinian uh, poet and uh, uh, pe uh, people from Palestine who are, um, uh, we know uh, like somebody like Mahmoud Darwish is a great uh, poet. I'm gonna also talk about Palestinian uh, costume, uh, Palestinian dresses, and uh, also uh, uh, we'll be talking about Palestinian music. So it's gonna be every continent. I will be talking about three Palestinian city with their food and, and other stuff. So that will be, uh, 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 the biggest cause because I uh, really um, love because my mom and dad are Palestinian. They had to be. Uh, they have to leave their home mm. uh, and move and become refugee. And there is so many re uh, Palestinian refugee all over the world. And I'm doing it for them and for the people in Palestine. So, is it just cultural or also political? I mean, <clears throat> listen. I mean, I don't like to to go into political. I like to always do things that is peacefully and uh, to show uh, things in a peaceful way. And But when you start showing the culture and the food and everything that's been stolen by an occupier, so you know that is gonna be in, in political. But uh, mm. what we show and what I show in the 777 has nothing to do with political. I don't even, you know, I know, uh, um, a place called Palestine, and I don't know any other place apart from Palestine. Okay, that sounded really wonderful. Um, I think that we have to stop soon. So um, last question. Um, most of us are teenagers or young adults. So um, maybe put yourself into our shoes for a moment and think about what you would tell your younger self. I would say to you, all of you, you have a brain in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself to absolutely any direction you can choose. You have your own and you, you, you are your own self. And you know what you know now and that you are the one who will decide where to go and who decide what you wanna do. It's all up to you. Doesn't matter what's your parents, what's school, what's everything that you do. If you don't want to do it, you are not gonna be going anywhere. I will give you one single advice. We say in Arabic, in Arabic, uh, uh, beautiful things from the Quran. We say, everything that you do is a through the intention. And if your intention is good, then you're gonna succeed in your life. If you have an intention that is not good, you might go a little bit further, but you're gonna go down very quickly. And, and don't be scared from uh, failure. You know, uh, a guy called uh, Thomas uh, Edison, um, and he said something really amazing that I love. He said that I have not failed. He, he always try uh, um, 
you know, to see the bulbs of the electricity, uh, that he invented it. He said, I have not failed, but I've just found a 10,000 way that it won't work. So he tried so many times and he knew what is not working. And in the end, he did what uh, is working. So um, I would say to all of you that, you know, um, and I can put myself, I can tell you about myself. I had absolutely nothing. When I arrived in England, I left the ambassador. I have nobody. I didn't know anything. Yeah. And I was stuck in the kitchen for many many years cleaning and cleaning dishes all so I can save money to go to university you are privileged to be able to be at school and you don't have to worry when you go to university that you will be able to study and you don't have to worry to go and work for five six seven years in the kitchen washing dishes so you can save money to uh, go and uh, study so um, you know appreciate all the little stuff go back home and uh, kiss your mom and dad and say, I love you. And thank you so much for giving me a roof on the top of my head. And um, I am ready to see my life and I'm gonna go to university and I'm gonna do what really excite me and I'm gonna achieve my dream and I am going to make a difference. Thank you so much for this motivating advice and also for this whole talk. You said so many inspirational and motivating things. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that we're done with the questions now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, been a pleasure and I love all the question. And um, yeah, it's great. Thank you, Amelia. And, and, and thank you, Yasmin. And and everyone in uh, Moonshot uh, Pirate, you guys doing an absolutely an amazing job. And that's, you know, that's what I call a change and different. This is what you do now. You're gonna get it uh, really big time. And I look forward to see all the results and the positive.